license is it's a subjective concept um, and that would be a challenge. Um, the panel's term of reference raised heavily on the risk management and as it should. What we're observing is the anti-fracking movement demanding a very low, if not zero tolerance of risk for the, nat the natural gas onshore industry. It may be tempting to jump on that bandwagon, but to do so sets a very challenging and highly expensive precedence for all other recurring, sorry, all other current and future industries. You heard from Brent Murdoch from Vista Gold yesterday reporting or requesting that there be a clear delineation between the natural gas industry and what I'll deem or refer to as the hard oil mining. Brent points out that hard oil mining has already experienced the repercussions of legislation relating to land access relevant to the natural gas industry having an impact as his industry was swept up in that legislation by default. They'll be very tempting to apply stringent regulations and requirements to this industry, the natural gas industry, particularly to satisfy the very loud anti-fracking movement. Um, but to do so could have very detrimental immediate and long-term financial impacts on all other industries. It's fairly reasonable to say that most industries in the NT are young in, their, in terms of development. They may have been here a long time, but they're still very young industries. Um, it wouldn't be possible or fair to regulate the natural gas industry to have very strict weeds management requirements when so many other industries around the, driving around the countryside with no weeds management practices currently. Interestingly, the natural gas industry has a self-imposed weeds management um, practice that it, it follows quite well, and that clearly exceeds most other industry standards. Very few other industries do have these self-imposed or regulated standards. The pastoral industries have many visiting vehicles coming and going, road trains, salespeople, stock inspectors, staff, pastoral and civil contractors, to name a few. Pastoral properties are not required to decontaminate these vehicles, nor is there a self-opposed industry requirement or practice. Free travelling tourists and tourist companies drive across our outback freely, and there is no weeds or management practices currently imposed on them. And you could imagine the outcry if the grey nomads got caught up or swept up in some sort of weeds management practice as they moved around the countryside. There are a large number of vehicles driving out bush to service Indigenous communities on any given day. Government agencies, teachers, health police, not-for-profit organisations. Indigenous people themselves travel freely across the country. They all do so without regard to good weeds management practice. So weeds management practice is still in its infancy in the NT. Most management is stimulated and often financially supported by government, including um, in the pastoral industry. In Catherine tomorrow, the NT government is hosting a weed contractor's information session to explain to industry about their move from educating property owners on their responsibility to moving to the infancy of a compliance um, stage. So having spent 10 years educating people about their responsibilities, financially helping them and having a lot of programs to actually get weeds management practice underway, they're now at a stage of saying, okay, you now know you've got this responsibility, we're going to start to move into the compliance stage. But compared to other states, that's how far behind we are. Now there's a big cost impost on that, and so if we're sort of saying the gas, natural gas industry is legislated at this level, there could be this unintended consequence of catching all the other industries that are no way near ready to move to that, that level of regime. Um, we, in, as NAMCO, we are um, Indigenous Business Development Consultants, so we are in the process of helping a consortium of communities develop um, some quarries out on the western part of the region. Um, that will require them to get land access, and in some cases, land access on pastoral properties. Now, this business will start with zero finance and any grant funding that it can get from government. If, in the process of getting access to develop a quarry to get materials for roads that are so critically needed by oil industries, they get caught up in land access bargaining, and the, the landholder has a similar expectation that they will come forth with royalties and all other types of development that you know, the large, um, well-cashed-up industries can afford, little companies like this would not get started or they would never be able to access the resources on that land. Currently on pastoral properties, the, land, the Pastoral Act um, indicates that if you have a pastoral lease, you will give 
um, you can expect that people will come onto your land to harvest trees, and that can be didgeridoos. So again, from a land access point of view, you've got Aboriginal people, hopefully, only Aboriginal people going out and harvesting trees to make didgeridoos, but if they're caught up in some land access regime where there's got to be compensation and additional royalties and so forth, that could have an unintended consequence that could severely detriment their ability to harvest on those, those properties. Um, we've got another Aboriginal business who purchased an existing quarry um, lease. It was initially established 20 or 30 years ago when environmental regimes were quite different. Um, before he could commence, he had to get a land, a mine management plan, so that was a consultancy fee starting of about $5,000. Based on what the findings of that were, though, he was going to have to rehab the site before he could even commence extraction. So he had all of these upfront costs that the previous operator didn't. Um, and to some extent, this is an industry that's still in its infancy, and, and somebody coming from interstate might look at that, that management plan and say, gee, that's a piece of cake and very low impost and, you know, don't know what you're worried about. But when you're starting with nothing, it, a lot of Aboriginal people are coming from generational poverty or coming off welfare. Um, all of these additional upfront costs before you can even start to um, produce your product, never mind sell it, is an added burden. And I can sort of see that potentially in the quarrying extractive <coughs> industry, any impost that goes on, on the natural gas <coughs> industry could flow down the line sooner than, than we would like it to. Um, we've got another company who does a whole variety of things, but they do weeds management, they do roadside slashing, and they have government contracts to um, manage the roadside amenities, so taking the rubbish and restocking water and firewood and so forth like that. And just coming back to the weeds management, this company, ironically, is actually attempting to get work for within the gas industry, so they will have good weeds management practices, but just hypothetically, as they're travelling from um, the Stewart Highway out to the, the Cape of Carpentaria, if they have to decontaminate along the way and on return at, at several locations because they've gone into roadside stops, um, a bit like the tourism industry, it just starts to make that very unviable. Um, we've got um, Bradshaw, um, sorry, not we, but Bradshaw, a Timber Creek contracting company, so an Aboriginal company based at Timber Creek. They formulated um, as part of an Indigenous land use agreement and part of that is that they have, were given some preferential treatment for some defence contracts. Um, they've been operating for six or seven years. They've got to a stage now where the defence contractors are requiring that they become ISO compliant, if not certified. They got a quote of $80,000 to implement um, and a 9001. That's beyond them at this stage, although they are fortunate enough that they're in an industry that long term they can possibly justify the cost and recoup the cost. Um, but, at, but a lot of it, Indigenous and non-Indigenous businesses are getting started in industries that really could not afford to absorb that sort of cost. So whilst the mining industry does maintain that level of um, standard and insist on it, obviously if you contract to them um, you, the economic return that you can get generally justifies taking those measures. But a lot of our other industries in the NT are not that viable and they're a long way from being able to absorb those sorts of costs. So I guess um, in, this, in closing on that sort of um, topic is that recommendations relating to risk management, um, we would ask that you keep in context of the, the, the um, I guess cognizant of the unintended impacts that it could have on all other industries as these legislation recommendations flow through. Um, I know that there's a view in the community sector largely coached by outside interests that the onshore gas should be stifled so as not to detract from it, the interest and investment of renewables. And There's a number of concerns about what we consider to be this myopic view. It assumes that the energy companies that can't access go gas will automatically focus on renewables. Renewables, broadly speaking, are still heavy reliant on government subsidies. For a company to have spare funds of a large-scale R&D, they, they need to be very viable and have cash reserves. Denying energy companies this opportunity to continue to generate revenue through gas reduces the likelihood of them being financially viable to continue to invest in other R&D. The view denies a number of small communities, including Catherine, the opportunity to generate income and generate new employment. <coughs> Sustainable renewables, if achievable at all, 
is likely to be decades away. It's not fair and reasonable to expect this generation of businesses, of this generation of employees, particularly youth, to be denied the access to the development of onshore gas industry. For an industry that is futuristic, still has considerable question marks about its own economic and environmental sustainability, and importantly, its capacity to deliver truly consistent energy to meet the needs of all of the energy consumers. So colloquially speaking, the local community is being asked to take a hit in their pocket or to make way for a renewables industry that has significant unanswered questions regarding its environmental impacts. The infrastructure needed to generate renewables is very contentious. There are reports that indicate manufacturing a wind turbine with an expected lifespan of 20 years will not generate enough energy savings to cover its cost of manufacturing and operation. Um, Manufacturing solar panels involves heavy consumption of energy and generates considerable toxic waste. Anecdotally, I've been advised that 60% of the world's supply of coal comes from the Congo, where child mining labour is still a reality. Um, so there are concerns about the environmental impacts, sorry, and there are concerns about the environmental impacts of disposing solar panels at the end of their life. There are many other real and potential environmental concerns about renewables, and whilst they should, whilst they remain relatively unanswered at this stage. We don't think that it's reasonable that the natural gas onshore industry should be denied an opportunity to develop in the NT based on similar concerns. Um, the other one is uh, about hidden agendas, and you people are much better informed um, through this process than I am. Lock the gate is essentially a land, land grab, trying to change title of land. Um, the anti, some of the anti-fracking movements you know, have, have overtly said we're really about stifling this industry for the investment into renewables. Um, and there are other agendas going on as well. Um, sometimes you've got Indigenous people, if you look at the Makati um, uranium situation, the people, the landowners most affected, they informed themselves, they travelled interstate, um, they received briefings from lots of experts and were well informed as they took their decision about the advantages and the risks. They made a well informed decision and agreed to a waste repository on their land. Non-beneficiaries, some closely involved, consider this group to be poorly and emotively informed. But some people in assessing who was really driving that, it was the non-beneficiaries. So people who weren't going to be financially benefiting from that were then used as the catalyst by some of the anti-lobbyists. Um, to the point that um, you know, the landowners were pressured, the land council was pressured, and that decision was overturned. <coughs> Now, what we're seeing now is the Muckety people running two court cases against their land broker, the Northern Land Council. Um, and I guess we're sort of seeing there are similar parallels here. And I mentioned in my previous briefing about you know, the emotional manipulation of Indigenous people, um, not necessarily for the right reasons. Um, so, in an ideal, well, what we consider to be an ideal world was if you were conducting in another intervention review, would be commissioning a report on where is the money coming from that's funding the various lobby, anti-lobbying movements? What is their real agenda? Because it's not concerned about Aboriginal people as we see it. It's not concerned about the NT economy. It's not concerned about the NT environment because there are lots of other NT environment issues out there that they are completely ignoring. Um, so in, in that sense, um, being asked to make decisions about stifling or, or limiting an industry, sorry, inhibiting an industry from progressing based on some, some fairly dubious um, agendas, I guess. Um, yesterday, in the question with, uh, to Jeff Crowhurst was about business matching, or about um, what is KMSA, uh, it's sort of view about outsiders coming in and what we were doing with that. Um, business matching is something that KMSA actively encourages. Any outside business needs some sort of premises, either temporary or permanent when it leak locates here. A lot of the industrial land is owned by local businesses. So as an outside business comes in, they will typically get connected up fairly quickly and local businesses may benefit. Um, they, they can become their agent, um, they can be kind of subcontracted. Um, or they may actually be supplying other services and repairs and maintenance direct to that company. Um, so we've never considered outsiders necessarily coming in as a, as a major threat. Um, we understand that we don't have the scale, the expertise um, or the overall um, skill capability and, and that we do need to match 
business match up and partner with other organisations. So, um, and in some cases, um, as Jeff probably didn't get it, uh, the opportunity to articulate very well, but um, Crowhurst Engineering was a small mum and dad company last for, for a number of years. Um, they've just recently partnered up with Goodline, who are a national company with over the 4,000 employees. So it's now Crowhurst Goodline, and they have a remarkable um, expansion of capacity overnight um, as, as they move into Goodline systems, have access to Goodline's technology, have access to a pool of 4,000 people that they can call on um, any time they need skilled resources. So that's a sort of a very practical example where um, business matching has worked very, very well. Um, I think there's probably a range of other issues, but um, that's probably the, the core of what I wanted to put across. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, just want to ask you one question. What, what, uh, I'm not trying to be clever by this question by any means, but what, what does social licence mean to you? I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a firm of, uh, sorry, it's a term of some sort of indeterminate <coughs> flexibility and meaning. But, but what does it mean to you? I probably had to read up on it in the sense of looking <laughs> at the textbook of what, what is it. So um, next two of us. <laughs> a level of um, that the community or the stakeholders have a level of trust that um, the deliverer of the activity is going to do so in a safe and sustainable manner. That's not going to cause harm. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. I can't, can't argue with that. It's great. Um, yes, Dr. Anderson. Uh, yeah, Ms. Cummings, I, I thought your analysis of social licence was excellent. Actually, mm. really excellent. Yeah. And um, some food for thought. And I, so I've got a question of um, how do you explain the different standards? So that why is there a social licence for some of those industries? Yeah. What is it about fracking, do you think, that, that has this social licence? My belief is that the industry hasn't come and maintained a permanent presence in the region. So it, it is about, um, it's about developing relationships. Um, human natures inherently want to, to um, relate to people that they know and, and then the trust develops. So by not having a permanent presence in the territory generally, um, part of their problem was that the minister of the day, there was, I guess there were some issues around whose responsibility was it to educate the broader public about the process of fracking. Um, so the, pub, so the, the government didn't come out and take that role. Um, then they called inquiry. So the industry, as we've interpreted, felt, well, we better wait for the, the, the Hawke report to come through before we go out. So there was still a, a big void. Um, and there's also, in some parts of that industry, has been the view of while we're exploring and we don't know whether we need to be there permanently, whether it'll be viable enough to be there permanently or not, we don't necessarily consider that we have to actively engage with the community because that's, there's a cost attached to that. So we'll wait until we know whether we've got a firm resource and then we'll go and engage and educate the community. And it's that thought process that we sort of see was. That may have been an okay theory, but because the reality over here of this anti-fracking movement, that, that theory isn't working and you need to adjust that and come right back at the exploration stage and be here permanently and engage and educate very, very actively <coughs> um, now, not well before now. <laughs> but even now, as KMSA, it's, it's very, so Jeff mentioned, Jeff Crowhurst mentioned yesterday that KMSA is attempting to get a shop front um, financially supported um, by the industry um, and hopefully government. Um, but that would be a shop front with factual information where anybody can come in and um, the companies, the actual um, industry companies can display material about their particular project, have access to topic experts about their particular project and, and just be a resource for people. This is August. You, you know, the government's expected to make a decision by February. In reality, this in some sense is all a little bit too late. Um, but in the hope um, that the industry continue, it's something that still needs to be done if the industry is allowed to continue. And the sooner that we can get on with it, the better for, 
better, the whole concern. But yeah, that's been part of our dilemma, is the industry hasn't wanted to be here permanently, because there's, I, I guess there's costs and costs on that, and there's been a philosophy around when they really needed to engage with the community. Um, as, as KMSA, I'm speaking KMSA now, um, we've very much been about, you, you already should have been here, um, coupled with the frustration of government. And if I, probably the other aspect was the minister at the time took a very negative approach to the anti-lobbying movement. He didn't treat them respectfully. He engaged in abuse on social media that just um, caused them to get more angry and hostile. Um, and in fact inflamed and kept them much more motivated in that process. And that was, you know, in hindsight, that was horrifically unfortunate. Whilst a lot of that was going on in Catherine, his counterparts in Darwin were not taking a lot of notice that that was even going on. So this movement got very, very strong, very almost um, under the radar. And, and when it finally popped out of the box and the government at senior level woke up, it, it was way too strong. And, and they were behind the eight ball from, from then onwards. Um, at commissioning a Hawke report, and even that wasn't well marketed. Um, coming into the last election, you know, the, the then government was trying to decide should it also suggest a moratorium to negate Labor's moratorium, and so even within government, it couldn't decide whether it should come out very strongly pro and, and, and educate, or whether it should go softly and, and, and negate by having its own moratorium. But as a consequence, it didn't fill that void in any way. So. That's thank my you. analysis. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, Professor Priestley. Thank you. Uh, Ms Cummings, at the uh, consultations in March, you gave an indication that there was a degree of intimidation uh, against those who wanted to talk about the economic benefits and so on, the business benefits for the community. Do you think that that has changed at all uh, as a result of uh, some of the discussions that have gone on uh, relating to this inquiry? Not, not sufficiently enough. Um, you pick up a Tennant Creek newspaper and there is a recruitment advert there looking <coughs> for positions for somebody to come work for the, an Indigenous organisation, um, something or other seeds, um, and that position is very much an anti-fracking um, lobby group and, and that advert appeared sort of in the last two or three months. So the anti-lobby group is still working very hard. They're still out there sharing their propaganda. They are still in the Indigenous communities um, working actively. So no, I don't think so. And the, the group in the middle are closing their ears in the sense that they don't really know what to believe. So they've just stopped listening in some senses. Yes, Dr Ritchie. Um, um, Yes, I, I think that your, your um, discussion of social licence was, was excellent. Um, but um, just put it to you that, that what the sort of the model that you're talking about, I think we all do to an extent, is the idea that it can be influenced. It's influenced really by something, um, uh, it, by the, the, the sort of the, the, the players themselves. So it's, 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 it's influenced by governments, it's in, influenced by the industry, or it's influenced by lobbyists and that which how they position and who gets in first has a major effect on social license. Um, our experience on this panel has been that the evidence we've got um, and when we've talked at focus groups and we ask on what basis have you formed these views it's largely personal and so people know people who know people or who have experienced the industry in Queensland and New South Wales um, and have had families that are affected by it that seems to be the main driver for, for how they feel about the industry. And I think that, um, that, that in many ways the, the social media and, and the connectedness of, 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 of ordinary people um, has been more important than the spin that's done by industry, lobby groups or the government. And that, um, that dealing with the um, the, the industry will not have a social licence until it actually is, a, is an industry that, that, that productively engages with the community and can be seen to be doing so. So that it's, um, it's not a matter of spin or who gets, gets in first, it's a matter of actually doing it properly. And um, the evidence we've had from the industry in, uh, 
in Queensland is that it still behaves like an international corporation and rolls over the top of local people whenever, it, whenever it's in, its in the interests of the industry to do so. So that's, that's, that's the evidence we've got and I think that um, um, I just sort of put it back to you as, a, as where we're up to at least um, so far on the panel. Okay. My only comment to that is that the stories about people mm. are being fed by people from the anti lobby group sure, who are embedded sure. and getting the face to face relationships. Sure, sure. So, but yeah, the, the rest of it, yes, there is you know, mm. the view that industry, and even from KMSA's point of view, we said right from the start we, we were very naive about fracking, mm. um, so we wouldn't form a view, and we, did, we were a long time forming a view, and, and that was definitely our concern that they would roll over the top. Mm. Um, we had, a, a, I guess, a nice example where a contractor went and made an approach to Santos and he was pretty much told, unless you're a member of KMSA, we'd be reluctant to deal with you. Mm. So in a, it's just one small of example of sort of saying, yes, we're committed to, to engaging at the local level. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that sort of um, mm -hmm. behaviour mm. is a step in the right direction. Yeah, no, thank you. Anybody else? Um, again, I, I noticed you were reading from a paper. Is, is it possible to get a copy of that paper by way yes. of submission? Thank you very yes. much. That'll help because, um, uh, again, I'm, I thought your discussion of uh, social licence operate was, was excellent um, and uh, timely and, and, and very pertinent. Um, it's a term that's often bandied about on both sides of the ledger um, without anyone actually sitting down and, and sort of articulating what, what's meant by it, what they mean by it how it's being used. So it was good that you actually engaged in that sort of deeper analysis. So uh, thank you very much for taking uh, time to come and present today and uh, give us a, uh, um, uh, another perspective. It's uh, very much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you.